Um, is my screen visible? Yes, you can see. Yes. Yeah. Um, Victor, if you don't mind, I'll be using you as the primary point of reference um, in terms of responses, <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Not it. All right. Um, okay, so just going through the course outline. So what I'll just basically do is I'll first go through the course outline. And um, for today, we'll just talk about what this course is about and um, outline how it will be structured and maybe... Yes. Hello? It's visible. Um, is that a breaking connection on my side or on the other side? He's also breaking his end. Oh, okay, that's fine. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'll just basically give an outline of the course, um, what you may, what, what what you should expect from the examination in terms of um, the structure and also the general. Um, ratio regarding the coursework as compared to the examination. And then um, I've also gone ahead and um, allocated topics to the different groups for presentations. Um, considering the, val the volume of um, the class, most of the assignments will be either in pairs or as groups. So yeah, I'll just also outline that. Um, yeah, so basically starting off with the course, this is um, Ethical Hacking and Digital Forensics, MSC DA610, um, and I'll be taking you for it as I mentioned earlier. I think we have about three or four days together where we'll be doing this course. And from what, I, what I've experienced with um, previous groups is the ideal amount of time I may spend within a class um, of interactions is maybe between two and three hours. And then the bulk of it is typically in uh, as a form of self-study. Um, the interesting thing though is this particular semester we've been advised that um, for the course we, or generally for any courses that are being taken for master's students under GBS, um, we'll be taking more of a project approach or a learn by yourself approach in a way whereby we avoid the system of creating um, very comprehensive slides and then giving them to you so you can just, um, for lack of a better word, regurgitate everything we would have said in the slides and paste that in, in the examination. So it's like a different approach from how things used to be done in the past. So you'll find, could see, many of, much of the work we'll be doing is um, may seem like a sort of a project, be it in pairs or in groups. And um, just to clearly outline how things will go, um, at the end of this course, typically what you have in academia is um, students do assignments, and then after they're done with the assignments, uh, or for that particular course in that semester, they lose that information and they never touch it again and stuff. So basically, um, one of my personal objectives from this course uh, before we end or before we finish is to ensure that all the contents that you have, which is the assignments we'll be doing and the group work we'll be doing, we, using digital technology, of course, will make use of technology to make sure that all the resources that you create as students somehow end up being reusable in the future. If not for, for you, then for other students who will come after you. Uh, putting this simply, if we are to say you'll be creating, um, well, obviously you have to do some practicals in this particular course. Um, and just a spoiler, you'll be doing them in pairs. So for each of these practicals that you'll be doing, you'll have to prepare something called the lab reports which I'll give you a structure as in Gutenia right, I say. And then you also have to create a video demonstration of that, um, of that particular presentation. So um, 
after you've produced those two things, typically that would have been the end of it. But then this year we're taking a bit of a different approach to ensure that um, even the lab practicals that you prepare, they end up actually being something that can be used later on. So effectively, all the lab manuals that you're preparing as pairs or as um, groups and so forth, they'll contribute towards like a, a compendium sort of that's anyone who's interested in learning how to um, do penetration testing or to do digital forensics using different tools, all they would have is this particular manual that is um, a composite or that's, um, a combi that's like a combination of all your work. So considering that, I think we're about a um, hundred and something. That means basically that particular compendium would have like close to a hundred um, demonstrations or a hundred manuals of how you can use uh, different tools in security. So obviously for us to have um, a hundred unique tools and manuals for how you can use those specific tools, that'll mean no two groups or no two pairs can repeat um, the same presentation or can repeat the exact same tool in the exact same way. And obviously, if you do end up doing that, um, there will be consequences in that you have to share your marks. Like let's say um, after you submit your work and then I review it as the assessor, um, giving a grade between zero and 100, if it's really well done, very articulate, and there are all these really good diagrams in it explaining the whole process, then th that won't stop me from giving you 100. But then if it's um, shoddy work in some way or the other, then you'll get quite a low mark um, for, the, for, the, for that um, lab manual presentation. And then if you're two groups, or let's say if it's three groups that have submitted the exact same report, um, you'll then have to share your marks. Like let's say if it's two groups and the mark for one of the two is, um, let's say 75 out of 100. No, let me say 80 out of 100. That means um, if it's two groups that duplicated the same assignment, it becomes 40 out of 100 for one and 40 out of 100 for the other. And if it's four groups, then it just ends up as 25, 25, 25, 25. So that's just basically something, or I wouldn't say an incentive or something like that, to make sure that you don't um, duplicate each other. Because um, coursework actually has um, a sizable percentage as compared to the previous years. I think it's 50% for coursework and 50% for the examination. So basically, um, that's what we're doing with um, the lab work you'll be doing in pairs. Then in addition to that, for each and every tool you create um, a lab manual for, or that you do a lab experiment for, you also have to create a video for it. So that means after you create the video, all you do is you upload that video on YouTube. Then we take that YouTube link and we attach it, or we just paste it as a link within that particular report of yours. So ultimately, if somebody gets access to this um, compiled lib manual of ours, which is obviously open source, so we won't be expecting to make millions from it or anything. If somebody gets access to that particular lib manual, um, they don't only have access to the list of instructions, which are very clear with um, diagrams that tell you what you're supposed to be seeing when you're doing what, but it should also go ahead and give you a link to a YouTube video where this whole process is actually shown to you. So in terms of um, the practical work, that's how we'll be doing it um, for the pairs and the group present and the lab uh, work. The other aspects we'll be covering is for the group presentations. So as I said, again, with group presentations, it will be a much, much more different approach. And obviously, as you know, at this level, which is a postgraduate level, the level of plagiarism expected is supposed to be always below 20%, not just in the examination, not just in your, in your, in your dissertation, but even within your assignments. 
So um, in this case, what we'll be doing is um, I'll allocate a few topics to you, which may be like new topics within the domain of cybersecurity, um, or they may be topics that have existed for so long but are still current till today. So you just basically have to do a research on that topic. Then after you do your research on that topic, you prepare a PowerPoint presentation, PowerPoint presentation um, which is one part of it. Then the second part is a Word document, which is more like a composite of all the research you've done in a structured way on that particular topic. So for example, um, if I'm to give you a topic, you could see kind of um, the MITRE attack framework. What you do is you would then research on what exactly MITRE is, um, what the attack framework is, its purpose, how it's used, and um, how you can integrate it into an organization, and even how it can relate or how it can be used by companies in Zimbabwe and so forth. So after you do all that research, you create a Word document with all this information. Then in this particular Word document, um, you structure it like sort of like a chapter that you would put in a book. So you do that research, you structure all your work, and you're doing this as a group. So at the end of it, um, when you're putting the list of names of people who contributed towards that particular topic, all your names, as in the people in the group, should appear there. So you all get um, the appropriate credit for the work done. So after um, you've done your research and you've presented that particular Word document appropriately and well, Obviously, there'll be marks given for the clarity of the report that you present, and that how well do you explain the concepts in it. Um, obviously, there'll be bonus points if you try and put it in a local context in a way that even someone who isn't in security um, understands within Zimbabwe. And besides the aspect of clarity of the work that you submit in the report, there's also the aspect of content. So as, do as much, research as, as much research as you can on the topic, because the amount of content you submit um, adds points to, or adds marks to your final mark for that section of um, the continuous assessment. And then, so after you've done that particular report, you then compress it into a PowerPoint presentation which is what you will then present to the rest of the class. And if any people in class have questions, they can ask them, but given the amount of time that you may have for presentation, they can always then refer to your report, which you also submit um, as part of it. Um, yeah, so basically, are, are there any questions so far before I get into um, the details of the course outline? I say, I think uh, my first question is, um, you've mentioned quite a bit of stuff that might take a bit of um, remembering. Is there a chance that there's a document that um, stresses uh, these important points that you've mentioned? Yeah, sure. Um, I can document this and then upload it on uh, Google Classroom. So at least everyone is aware of what needs to be done and how it's supposed to be done. But thanks for raising that. I will, I will I right, sure thank you said that would be appreciated. Yeah, out of curiosity, is there anyone who is recording um, these classes for others who may not be able to attend the class right now? Oh, perfect, thanks. Um, you, you'll be sharing the video with others, yes? Oh, that's fine then, thanks. Okay, so, um, Basically, uh, are there any other questions? Um, I understand that was more like to do with the structure and the approach being taken, but any other questions um, on that or anything else before I proceed? Okay, um, so I'll assume that um, there are no questions and everything is clear so far, or it will be made more clear um, when the video and the documents are shared. Okay, um, so moving on. So that's basically the structure of the course outline. 
Um, the last time it was updated, I think I, since the PDF, I did not update this, but um, the date should be January 2021, not um, 2020. There are a few other concepts that, that I've added um, to the course outline. And just to help you understand, when course outlines are structured, they basically have what's known as a course synopsis, which is set, which specifies what particular topics you have to cover. Um, you definitely have to cover in a particular, in a particular um, course and what units you have to cover in that course. So um, by virtue of this course um, being crafted, I think it was back in 2017, 2018, I think, um, some of the concepts that were there or that were making the, mess, the most noise around that time in cybersecurity um, took up quite a portion of what they called the core topics in the synopsis. So as you know, technology is very dynamic and as things continue to evolve, what was important or what was scary in 2017 is no longer as important or no longer as scary in um, 2021. So you would find that um, there are some topics that may seem quite old, like um, those to do with spoofing or to do with um, uh, other types of hacking, but they have to be understood because ultimately the goal is not just for you to understand what is current in terms of cybersecurity, but it's to also you know, help you understand um, like the underlying technologies or the underlying um, attack methodologies that have brought up things that are making the most noise these days like ransomware and all that. It's all um, a product of others, what may seem like smaller, types of attacks that used to happen in the past, but they've so like combined into what we now have as ransomware and APTs and so forth. And those terms, we'll discuss them and explain them as we go forward in the course. Um, so within the course, you'll find there's some concepts that may seem like a CDE relevant now, but their relevance is brought to the fore after we then explain the other new concepts that I've added into the course which is why I said uh, it's now for 2021, not 2020. So you'd find like um, some aspects, Jima, Sok, Nemasim, um, Kanaji, Maita Attack Framework, the Cyber Threat Intelligence and all that. It wasn't part of the initial course outline back in 2017 because back then, Angachi my novelties, as in something Jehuti, you would like my bullet trains or something in Zimbabwe. But then now that you've gotten to a stage, you would see um, technologies like this ubiquitous and dynamic thing and everyone seems to be able to work from home and work remotely, which exposes you to like all the different types of attacks, not only from within Zimbabwe, but from abroad. That basically means genocide, threat intelligence, Remasim, Remasok and all that. It has now become current information for basically all organizations because the attack surface is now the same for everyone. So you'll find that there's some old concepts in Zirippo, um, I think within the earlier chapters, and then you have these newer and more dynamic concepts um, that are now there towards the end. More like a progression year, evolution sort of like a cyber security in a way. So that's just basically to help you understand Guti, what makes this course different from a certification is it's mandatory for you to first understand what was there in the past. Which is why Pajnosa Mutua to like the Mother Bodhiyema universities in Zimbabwe, which is Zimche, they ask you to like list all the different courses that your students will learn and the importance of those courses. So when you get, um, which is, a, it's a process in which you're gonna like after every four years or after every five years, um, when this vote review process happens, so that's where you'll find that at that point in time, Babageta, that review, those, those are IP summers we all. But then as time goes on, you have to continually update this material. But then also making sure that we don't um, forget about including my older concepts and other specifier in the original synopsis. 
So they're just basically, I'm just trying to help you understand with why is the course structured in the way you will see it is structured um, later on. Um, then moving on, yeah, my name is Engineer Robert Shonua. A, a bit of a background about myself is, um, yeah, I've been in cybersecurity for a number of years. I think it's now 10 or 11 now, I've sort of lost count. So, um, I've been in cybersecurity for a number of years. I've worked in the banking industry for some time. Um, then I was in academia for an even longer time. In terms of qualifications, I've done my bachelor's, I did it by HIT in computer science, then the master's was um, at this university in India, known as the SRM University, which is in Chennai, if anyone has heard of India, Kasekshin in Kaku. Um, I spent two years in India from 2013 to 2015, um, studying information security and cyber forensics. And then I came back and uh, joined HIT again as a lecturer, and I left um, some time last year. So now I'm working for a different FinTech firm, um, back in the industry, but then, um, yeah, I'm still specializing within the field of cybersecurity and just volunteering here and there for my different initiatives. Um, yeah, so Pongwe, you've met at some conferences before, or Pongwe, you were one of my students at some other university and I got the design stuff. But that's just basically um, who I am in terms of uh, my profile. Then for emails, I'm sure you won't be using that often, but um, that's my email and all that, and the phone number edge also. Um, ideally, I would prefer to be under my class trips who communicate with me, because considering the size of the class, um, I may end up ignoring your messages unintentionally. Um, just what is somebody who's just spamming my phone. So I would prefer to only add in my class reps. If you have any issues um, or any requests, please bring them through um, your class reps. Then I can liaise with the rest of the class through them. All right. Um, Okay, so just basically, the purpose of this course is just basically to introduce you to my concepts A, ethical hacking, and my concepts A, digital forensics. Um, when it comes to merging everything, Chirin involved more program, Yenu, um, MSC, data analytics. I think the one person who is like that well versed to Clearly explain with you how does your learning Jama databases, re cyber security, re, like all the different courses you're studying, could you know either tie up together, say, is the engineer so on. So I'm sure she will, um, I will be doing it no justice if I tried to um, play her role and explain with you how does everything tie together. But she'll be taking you, I, I think, after this course is done, she'll be taking you for um, the course here, big data analytics. Since it's also basically her specialty because I got a master's in big data at the same university of India here. So basically, um, from my perspective, why you'll be studying your cybersecurity is no matter how you deal with data, it is um, still digital. And obviously, you'd have to have some ways to understand what it, how can it be compromised, as in how can the data that you're working with be compromised be it at any stage, when it's addressed, when it's in transit, or whenever. And um, that's where the aspect of ethical hacking comes in. So you understand, Kuti, how can hackers try and compromise my data? Then the other um, wing, or the other part of it, is digital forensics. You could see, well, whereas forensics is just basically um, doing investigations on what has happened with data, managing it, um, preserving it and then extracting um, evidence from some sources and media. So regarding that, whenever you do, with the, you deal with data and it's compromised in one way or the other by a hacker who's not ethical, that means you would have to bring to the fore these particular skills in some chat the digital forensics. How can you try and recover this information? How can you try and um, find out who did it, how they did it, and where they're coming from, and so forth. So that's basically how um, you may 
end up having to use the skills you learn in this particular course towards the broader picture in this particular program. So before I go into um, the methods of instru instruction and the schedule or the structure in my courses, actually, um, any questions so far? Um, Victor, are you still there? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks. You can, I'm glad you can still hear me. Um, so are there any questions so far from anyone? Okay. Uh, I guess there's no questions again. So, yeah, the middle of instruction is just basically mostly lectures, um, a lot, a lot of videos. Um, well, there's no dramatization because it's all online. Um, but there's also my group discussions and group work, um, mostly group presentations, my case studies, and you also have to read through a lot of material um, for this particular course. And, um, yeah, mostly, the language of instruction is English, but um, here and there, we're talking about Arashona and stuff, but feel free to speak whichever language you're comfortable with. Um, though I am not at all conversant um, with speaking in the will, unfortunately. Um, so very sorry about that. Then in terms of the material or the topics we'll be covering in this course, the first one is um, on hacking. Windows systems. Oh, that was the term, the term in the course outline. But it's just basically hacking um, my desktops and my workstations and stuff. So it's not just um, focused on Windows. So first, give an introduction to what is cybersecurity and the different um, domains within the field of cybersecurity. Um, then also some elementary aspects of cybersecurity, which includes what is hashing, what is encryption, and what is encoding and how they differ from each other. Um, we'll also cover network hacking, um, web hacking, password hacking, and then we move on to the next uh, unit, which focuses on different attacks that can be perpetrated against systems, which can be my input validation attacks, SQL injection, buffer overflow, um, privacy attacks, what TCP IP is and what checksums are, um, IP spoofing, port scanning, and my DNS attacks. Then the next unit is focused on my denial of service attacks, um, my spoof attacks, UDP flooding, and my DDoS models. Then next, we'll move on to my firewalls, like the different types of firewalls that exist. And then we have this generally new chapter, um, Yema Threats and Adversarial Behavior where we cover the different types of cyber crime, cyber crime that exist, NIMA fraud, and also how you can characterize my adversaries. What, what this basically means is we're just um, grouping the different ways and motivations uh, my hacker may have to try and compromise your system. And then one of um, well, my personal favorite topics now, is my um, elements of a malicious operation, which is um, quite a typical examination question. So what it basically covers is, Kuti, what would a criminal syndicate do which specializes in using my cyber attacks against people? Like let's say there's some company, and decided that Kuti, we're going to start offering um, ransomware attacks as a service to anyone who wants to pay us. So all you just basically do is you go on the internet, you look for them, um, you specify with the, how many servers or uh, what organization do you want to attack near ransomware, you make a payment of some kind, can I add it to US or whatever. And then they proceed to do the attack on your behalf. And then you, after later, if you're happy, this company has been um, attacked and all that, you then give a recommendation or a referral, could some other people. But if you want to attack a particular organization using ransomware, just go to this particular site or go to this particular company. Because I think I my companies that offer this particular service, 
the ransomware as a service. So you just give a referral equity, ah, can you please go to this company and um, they can help you out with doing this particular attack on a organization that has fired you. And then somehow you get paid Marids, my referrals, it's like a whole syndicate and the whole system. You're just basically taking how normal organizations work and applying it, but with a malicious um, intent. So yeah, that's one of the topics we'll be covering. And then also with what's the monitor attack framework um, and how you can manage my threats. Then moving on to pen testing. This one is, was also expanded a bit beyond um, the different methodologies that exist in terms of pen testing. Could see what approach can you use? Do you always want to use um, the approach or you want to use the NIST or you want to use the OSS TMM? Because whenever you're doing a pen test, um, you always have to make sure that you're following some sort of methodology. Uh, you can't just go to a company over Mushika OGT and a pen test and then you don't have any methodology that um, you're adhering to or that you're following. Uh, it's, it's very risky for the organization to actually do a pen test because there's like basically no scope in India to consult Shandiswa. And even Panya Kweza Kweza meets what they would have specified in uh, RFP, how it becomes very difficult because you don't know where you're supposed to start and where you're supposed to end. So with these methodologies, they basically outline with you what can you do and um, how can you do it in terms of performing my um, pen tests. Then also um, we'll cover my different web services that exist and how you can protect or attack my websites. Uh, my ideas is, could I say, the general process security pen test need to say. And then also another addition, which is um, cyber threat intelligence. Then moving on to forensics, obviously, what is computer forensics and how it um, relates to incident response, um, my different conceptual models that exist, and another very typical examination question type topic here, you know, is the cognitive task model or the CTM, which is basically a process that you tend to follow whenever you're doing um, a forensic investigations. Then my different standards that exist in computer forensics, um, a long process, you know, it's the incident response methodology. And lastly, um, how you can apply data analytics, Muma, SIM, Nemasok, where my SIM are my security incident and event management systems, and Masok are my security operation centers. So basically, we'll be covering with you how exactly do you use data analytics um, in those two domains of cybersecurity. So basically, that's what we'll, that's what we'll be covering in this um, particular course. Um, then this is quite old because the continuous assessment is fifty percent. Um, because Kudara time with the an exam online, um, not online. You you had to write an examination in English practical where 50% of it is theoretical, and this other 50% of the examination is you actually have to hack into a system or to recover some information from um, a hard drive or something like that, which is practical. But then unfortunately, could see we can't really meet in person. Um, what has now become the case is my questions actually have become more of my out to prac. If you think in the context TA, my lab is quite square, could you won't actually be doing the like the hacking process into a system, but it's more like you'll be explaining how you do it um, in an out to prac approach. Um, then obviously the final examination is also 50% and it's um, a three hour paper. Yeah. And obviously the grading is still the same um, in every way that we use it. The major sources we'll be using for this course, um, is that a question? Uh, the examination, is it practical, is it theory? 
Yeah, it's um, fifty percent is like as I said, getting it out to practice. It's not practical. You won't have to bring your laptop and try and hack into a system. No, it will be a practical question you have to answer. But you're answering it in theory. I mean, is that making sense? In in the same approach, it was my out to practice satirical high school and all. You're not actually typing for keyboard, but you're just saying, for me to compromise the system in this way, this is what I'll do, and then I'll use this tool, and then I'll use this tool to do this, and I'll use this particular tool to do to then do that and so forth. So that's basically how to be structured. It's not a practical exam per se. Okay? Yes, thank you. All right. So the main two books we'll be using for the course, the first one is the Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge. Um, I think if you just go kind of a Google and you type in the Cyber book, you'll find that particular book. Um, then the second book is, um, I think it's also share, I'll share it by Google Classroom also, so it's easier to download for you. Then the second one is Ra Kevin Mandia, the Nonzi Incident um, Response in Computer Forensics. It's well, considering that this is now 2021, it's quite old because it's like from 15 years ago, but the concepts are still the same in terms of how you deal with um, um, cyber incidents and how you perform forensics. It's still generally the same. Even if you consider quantum aspects like cloud forensics, at the bottom of it or like the foundation of it, is still based in my concepts I taught on Anakin and Mandia in this particular book way back then. So these two main sources are the primary ones we'll be using in this course. But then obviously you can supplement that knowledge with all these other textbooks. Um, okay, we'll see how can you use them. So um, that's basically the structure of the course and um, what we expect to cover um, before we finish the course. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to cover, or just to highlight, were my groups in my presentations, as in what exactly you're presenting as groups. But before we go into that, um, are there any questions before we do so? Or would you prefer a 15-minute break or a 5-minute break before we proceed? Five-minute break. Okay, so I guess um, since my watch is saying it's almost 18.15, we can just take a five minute break, um, then we reconvene uh, 18.20. Okay? Yeah, that's not it. Sorry.
Okay, um, I think we can resume. Um, I'll just reshare my screen now. Okay, uh, so now continuing. The next thing on the agenda is the allocation of um, group topics. Yeah, group topics. So what we'll have um, is, uh, I think we have, should be 14 groups, is it? So there's 10 from the weekend group and I think it should be four, yeah, and four from the block group. So we have a total of 14 groups um, that will be expected to present. Um, so I guess we can just say the first 10, go to the first 10 groups um, in the weekend class, and the last four go to the four groups in order from the from the blog class. So what I'll do is I'll just put in my names actually later on and share this particular document. We expect to have these presentations obviously before you write your examinations. So you're able to have enough time to do research and then actually present the work you have researched. Um, in terms of uh, time, that you will need for the presentations. I usually, I usually say um, 10 minutes per group, which is yeah, 10 minutes per group, so you'd have to split them into um, five minutes for the theoretical presentation and then five minutes for the practical presentation. Alternatively, we can make it 10 minutes per presentation where you have 10 minutes being for the practical and 10 for the theory, and your total presentation time being 20 minutes. Um, that's obviously up for discussion, depending on what you um, After you finish doing your research, how much time do you think you may need? But obviously, we may need, to, we will need to work with my timelines. So the date today is the 28th of July. Um, I'm not sure when exactly you are supposed to write your examinations, but typically we would say I would give you a month to work on the presentations. No, not a month. Yeah, okay, so I can work with a month for the presentations. Is that fine with everyone? Victor? Sorry, come again. Yeah, I was saying the next issue on the agenda is the issue of presentations, because um, that's part of your continuous assessment or part of your coursework. So obviously, um, you'd have to work in groups to do your presentations. So my question was, when would you like to do the presentations? Is it after, I proposed that after one month, which would mean around um, the 28th of August or maybe be to yeah, 28th August won't work. So you could say maybe the 30th or the 31st of August. That was my suggestion. Um, so I was asking that, is that okay with everyone? Because once we agree on a particular date, we won't be able to shift it. Oh yeah, I think it's okay. I think 31st is okay, sir. 31st is fine. Yes. Yeah, 31st. So I think that's agreed then. Um, so bear in mind that you have to work with the, 30, with the 31st um, as the date for the presentation. So please ensure that you'll have done all your research and prepared. I won't be able to take my requests. I would see true extra time, you would take the presentations. Just I mean it's like a month that you have and you're 
the groups akati kure zao. So it's just basically an issue of um, delegating my tasks to each other to make sure that everyone works towards um, having all that work presented and submitted well. So we'll work with the 31st of August as um, the data presentation. Then um, the other item that would need to be covered is the assignment in English to my peers, which is lab work. Of course, um, I'll upload my details that you would in the say on, um, on Google Classroom. But basically, as I hinted earlier, you'd be working in my peers, Muri two, 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 two. And you'd have to do my lab reports and do my practical demonstrations for two my tools, where one tool did ethical hacking and the second tool did digital forensics. So obviously, um, the tools that you are open to use are not just Emu Kali Linux, which is like um, the operating system that hackers use. You can use any tool of your choice. I'll also give you a different set of my websites that you can visit. I know Garachi Poster, my new tools. I'm saying one to one, I'm Kali, kind of different operating systems. So I'll give you that list um, and share it as well with the class. So we ensure that every single pair in Ngei they do not repeat my tools and Ngei Tony Because as I mentioned, if you repeat somebody else's tool, you end up sharing marks for that tool. So even if your mark was 100%, but Muri, Muri two my pairs, I eat the exact same tool, you end up sharing those marks. You only 50%, you only 50% in the other group which is just not fair, I guess. So yeah, you can use whatever tool you want to use when you're doing my labs in ethical hacking and digital forensics. So just to reiterate, you'll be writing a lab manual for two of my tools, where one of those tools, the digital forensics, and the second tool, the ethical, uh, the ethical hacking. So let's say, for example, you decide to choose a tool like Nmap for ethical hacking. You tell us, Kuti, I'll be using this tool as Nmap. This is what I did. This is how I did it. And this is my objective. Kuti, I wanted to just get um, a list of all the open ports and I got a particular company. And then after, all right, let me just see if I have Nmap, for example, here. Okay, so for example, let's say you would have decided, Kuti, I want to, for ethical hacking, I want to use Nmap. So this tool end of what I know is Nmap is um, the GUI version of the tool you know is the Nmap. So there's a tool you know the Nmap which you can use for a process you know the port scanning. With well, a port scanning, you're just basically um, going to a server and checking good and depth my different doorways or my different windows are open by server, which are basically known as ports. So once you know what the in my window, I can say I open the news, sort of like look for my different tools that you can use to access that server through those windows or through those ports. So um, an example, for the version that you use for Windows, the Nmap, and the Zmap. Nmap is a command line tool. The you know ya CMD, and then you type in the Nmap, and then it actually shows you the chip. How do you run my instructions like that? But then, like, for many people using a CLI or command line interface is not that user friendly for them. Though, mostly for anything that you need to do Jay hacking, it will need you to be very comfortable with the have command line interface. But anyway, for demonstration purposes, we're just going to use Zenmap. It works exactly in the same way as this one, your command line does. The only difference is it's a GUI version um, or a graphical user interface. So let's say, um, let me just put it here. 
So whenever you want whenever you want to test um, the security any tool or you want to test could, how can you use any tool you're hacking, there is one website that was created specifically for this purpose, inonzi0.webapsecurity.com. So if you actually go to this website, um, then you paste it as a link in your browser, it should open up what looks like a banking website. So what the site was created for is specifically for people who want to try and um, learn how to use my tools in hacking. Well, if you want to, so if you've created a tool that does re hacking and you want to test it on what may feel like a live environment, go by looking at this tool on the um, zero dot web security dot com. So, for demonstration purposes, that is what we'll be using, and that is what you should also be using. Pese patnuti um chimboids a kuita malebs in. You can always use this site for the testing. You can't use my company website because we were not given permission to do that. Um, okay, so that's the site Rajo. And then here, per section E, just specify with what scan do you want to do. We we'll just do a quick scan voice start. Hello? Hello, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, engineer. We, we, are, we are following. Yes, we can hear you. So, yes, we can hear you. My kids are going so I'm now using my um, alternative. Okay, so as I was saying, um, this is the site that we can use. Um, zero dot web app security dot com, and we had said could we try and do a quick scan. So all you do is you enter the domain panapa. If it was an IP address, we just put in the IP address there. Um, then we go and say scan here. So what it's doing is it's running this specific command it up against command E. So much that if we copy this thing, then Toya Kunoku. And we paste it. What's happening here is exactly what will also populate on this side. However, it may put in the kind of a few tags. Let me just add something. Mm. Okay. Um, so the reason why it was giving that error earlier in here, but the, I was not running it as an administrator. So it wasn't able to open any files or to write to any files on the computer. But continuing, so what I was saying is even if you copy this instruction, says Zaire, 
and then we come and paste it the command line here. What is being written here, said Kunu, is what would also be populated on this side. Um, I can't put it there right now because it then slow down my machine since it's now two processes at Wittiger, which are basically the same. But then I hope the point in, the point is understood. So what it does is um, it goes to that particular server, Eri, re0.websecurity.com, and it tells you what the IP address is, which is this one. So if you were to copy this IP address to with the three paste up by the target, the exact same results we're getting here are the exact same results we would get if we had just put the IP address. So the reason why in the second the dash V aga is um, even in the verbose mode, you could see the results that you get are not very detailed. If I had not put in Kadash Viaga, all you would have seen is um, yeah, Pereira just before up. No, just be yeah, just before you up. Runs initiating NSC at 1835. And then it would just stick Yakadaru. And you wouldn't know what is anything happening in background or something is actually happening from a scan. But now, okay, so dash V, it means it's in a verbose mode, meaning but it's telling you what, it, what am I doing at every stage of um, this particular scan and rubite. Which is why it then tells you what it's discovered this particular open port at that, this particular. Um, the reason why it has like so many open ports is not simply because um, they are being used. But as I said earlier, the whole purpose, yagadzirua zero.websecurity.com, as in this particular domain and this particular website, is for hackers to try and learn how to use my different tools in hacking on what may seem like a live environment. The alternative would have been would you, you would have to create your own website and make it vulnerable, which is a bit hectic for everyone. Alternatively, you could um, go ahead and download a tool, you know, the Metasploitable Linux, let's see. So if you just go and you say Metasploitable Linux download, um, it will show you my different links. It will see how can you download this thing as Metasploitable. So what Metasploitable is, is it's basically an operating system, which is intentionally vulnerable, as the guys at, at Rapid7 have rightly said. So what it is, is you have create, they created a server, which you can now use to do my tests, like a Sienna, Sienna, in my tools of security. So that's okay. the whole purpose. Here. Question? Yes, engineer. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe my network was not stable. Maybe I have uh, lost some of the information. Yeah, I'm seeing, uh, is it an app which is written Zen map, where you now we are putting a target and maybe our target here in place of uh, zero dot app or web app secure dot com. Maybe that's where I'll put maybe my website which I want to hack. And is that Zen map an app which already exists or is an application which you are supposed also to install the site? Just a question. Okay, uh, thanks for that. That's a very good question. Um, so Zen map is not pre installed by Windows. You actually have to go and download load it and install it. So if you just say kind of Zen map download, and the thing with all these tools of security is they're basically free. So there's no cost involved for many of them. So um, as you can see, you can download the free Nmap security scanner. As I mentioned earlier, Zen map is just a GUI version, EA Nmap. And it, so all you do is you just go to the site, um, you would say where you can download Zen Map Piacho. Um, then it gives you the different links which you can download. Yeah, the Nmap is the one actually. So what it does is, since it's for Windows, it downloads and installs both Nmap, your command line, which is this one, as well as the GUI version, Nmap, 
and we're going to have a picture here, which is what we call Zenlab. So um, in response to your second question, yes, trans target are that's where you put the website that you want to ethically hack. And it, so like, let's say you've been hired to do a dentist, Nikana, um, let's say Herald, then this is where you put kuti herald.co.zw because they've hired you to try and test the security of the systems. And so this is where you put your target or the particular website that you want to test security for or that you want to try and hack into ethically. Yeah, we are following. Thank you very much. It's not clear. All right, great. All right, so um, as I was saying just now, but, uh, the video will show you but when you download this, so it's quite straightforward. I don't have to copy that. Um, so as I was saying, an alternative to zero dot web app security is this well, you know, it's made exploitable. The difference between those two is e you can just use it on the fly, like just like that. You don't have to install anything, you just install your tool e hacking, then you start hacking. However, for meta exploitable, it's basically a virtual machine as in you're creating a computer within your computer that you then try and hack into. So that's the main difference in report between Metasploitable and um, Zero Security. Um, depending on Karamagos and Malibs, you can choose to either use Metasploitable or you can use um, Zero Web Security for testing. And I would like to reiterate this please do not use your company website for Maleb experiments in. Um, just to basically reiterate that, after we're saying kuti kanamagus with Maleb in your mujiti for ethical hacking, I've chosen to use Zenmap. Then you go on and you put your company website, kind of your company domain panapa as your target. We're going to take this information and you'll make my screenshots of the same information. Toisa Matati which compendium and it's Shema Labs S I think it title this year. What it then means is anybody who gets access to this compendium, or napakans kana hit.ac.zw, kana herald.co.zw, and then the whole list of my open ports and That is basically exposing that organization to anyone. Um, who's interested, this particular server or this particular organization has these flaws that we can exploit. So I reiterate and please avoid using your company websites in any of these experiments. And there's... Uh, thank you very much for that one. All right. Um, so I think we'll just leave it, each with a scan here. Um, yeah, so that's basically how Zenmap works. It lists my different open ports, and then guy report, and maybe after it's done, we'll return to it, and I'll explain my different um, results. So we're saying, Guti, in that particular lab report, you've created a video demonstration for Zenmap, which is straightforward and fine. Then also, you then decide, Guti, everything. You then decide, Kuti, you want to use a tool to demonstrate a tool in digital forensics. And the tool you've chosen to use is this one, you know, the last activity view. So what last activity view does is it basically goes through your computer and lists all the different activities, which includes opening the files, um, opening my folders, um, running some particular application, and so forth. So all that activity is recorded um, and stored and captured using Last Activity View. So um, as you can see, seeing up and it, this shows, but you've actually just run G, this application in you know, the Zen app just now. And we also try to run Nmap. And even now, Pandarana, this application knows everything. It's also been logged, Pudichi. 
yeah, I'm using it. The way this um, particular tool works is quite interesting. It's, it's based on my Shandiro Ani to Ani Windows for it to, how, how can I put this? For it to be very user friendly, which is a, a whole discussion we can have later on. Yeah, this concept, you know, the security triangle where you have security, um, usability, and functionality. Yeah, things like I and I'll explain that later on. So, returning to how this particular tool works, Jainoita is with Windows, it records every activity that happens in your system. The reason why they record these activities is not um, to monitor you, no, that's, that's not the reason. The reason is to make the user experience more seamless and more flawless. How do I mean? There are some particular files in your computer. You use them very, very frequently. So much that if we go to kind of my documents or something, if you go to File Explorer and it, and then you'll find there is this list here is my recent files. All these are uh, my files that you typically use um, very frequently. So whenever you start your computer and you know there's a file and I can is Romanero, you always find it she here and the recent files. But then where does that information come from? All that information is stored within the registry of computer. So the purpose is um, for the more frequently used files in your system, it should be easy for you to access them. So pani a feature in Momo Windows in on the MRIU can I could see most recently used. So basically it's like running running can you a a queue, or should I say, um, a, a list? Yeah, maybe I should I should call it a list. A list of all the files in your system or in your computer. So every time you access a particular document, that document gets to the front of that list here. And then, if there's some of the document that you access, it then also then puts you to the front of that same list. What you end up having is a list in organized in a way you could see all the files that you normally or that you frequently use are right at the top of that particular list. So Windows, like one of the frequent documents that you use is kind of salaries.xls, which is an Excel sheet in salaries. Every time you type into the salaries, um, then you go and find that particular document, it's always put kumsorugachi. And that's when you end up finding Guti, the speed or the amount of time it takes for your computer to open that salaries file is shorter than the amount of time it takes to open a file that you haven't accessed in like a very long time. That's basically the whole um, background behind this feature it was most recently used. So by virtue of us wanting to organize our information in a way, Guti, my files we end up, we obviously then have to have kind of a list of the number of times that file was accessed. Not just the number of times it was accessed, when that file was accessed. Because only after we know the file it will access when it's Zuru, take access to Marimu Zuru, do we then know Kuriji? It's a frequently used file. Which is how we end up getting all this information here. So all this information is basically the source which um, supplements Mashandiro Anuita, the MRIU feature on Windows. So, in short, this is basically a feature in Windows, but which you can then also use as part of your forensics investigations. For example, um, I don't know, how can we use this tool with T investigators of forensics? Any guesses from anyone? The question is, how can we use this tool for forensics? 
in an organization setting or in any setting. Let me see who I can pick. Leslie, Leslie Rogara. Yes. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just give an example. Um, we want to find out who is actually accessing certain files frequently and maybe why they may need to be accessing those files frequently. Maybe they are in HR and they run payroll, so it is kind of like a norm, which is, is it, which is expected. But then you can't expect somebody who is in, say, procurement to try to access uh, HR files. Um, that's that's what I'm just thinking from the top of my head. Okay, that's actually good. As an example, you could see you're using this information to just basically correlate with the, who has accessed this particular file at what particular time, um, which is great. Thanks for that one. Um, Tonga Mkarati, what are your thoughts on this one? Tonga. I guess he's not around. Um, Tonga Chirao. Uh, good evening. Uh, I think the two can uh, assist us in uh, analyzing or uh, do, do, doing an audit trail of who accessed what file at what time. For example, suppose it's a bank and you get a file that has been accessed in the middle of the night, just to, trip, uh, to be a red flag that it might be something malicious that it happened because it's way uh, of office hours. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, thanks for that contribution. Um, so I, I think another approach that I'll be taking with this course is I'll actually I'll award marks for contributions and participation. The challenge that we would, that's, I think it's like a global challenge in Boja currently, right? Is you'll find that um, in almost every university setting, be it at a high school, at a university, it's difficult to have people engaged more online. It's like really, really difficult because it's tempting to engage in class at the same time and there's life happening next to you, but and stuff. So people just tend to just leave their um, their computers logged in. And everyone believes they're also in the classroom. So I think um, one. Because personally, I, I believe good engagement is one of the key things that helps us learn better. Kuti, when you explain something you're not very sure of and you get corrected, that sticks in your mind as compared to just having information like getting bombarded and affects every single time. Those things just sort of like get in through one ear and go out through the other. So, yeah, just to reiterate, we may, not we may, we will be awarding. Um, some points during um, for presentations. So even Mamur in the same group, there are presentations, and then also Muri in the same pair, Rema Lebu You'll still find with there are some people who would have uh, more marks than the same person you worked with, my pairs in my groups, and this is what we'll be contributing. So yeah, um, to Leslie and Tindai, thank you for that. So moving on, um, where is the application? So that's basically um, how Last Activity View works um, when it comes to my apps in digital forensics. Okay, um, let me close that. So let me get to, so we'll just go through um, some of the slides I repo. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask um, or raise them. 
Just one second while I take down a few things. Okay. Um, so what we'll be covering first is hacking Windows, which covers network hacking, web hacking, and password hacking. All right, would anyone want to maybe attempt to explain what cybersecurity is from a general understanding of what is cybersecurity? Courage in the matter. Courage, what are your thoughts on what cybersecurity is? Um, evenings, I just came into the lecture now. I'm going to say my view, but I, I, I haven't been listening to what was happening in the past couple of minutes because my network had lost, had lost me. But all the same, I think cybersecurity is all about, oh my God, uh, <laughs> the risks that we are exposed when we use the internet or the attacks that may, might, might come to a company, to their website or to their servers through internet usage, something to that extent. Yeah, that's actually a good attempt. And um, thanks for joining us. All right, so maybe to add to what Courage has highlighted as in the definition of cybersecurity, it basically covers um, three main concepts which are known as the CIA triad. Let me just write that down so it's easy to recall. Known as the CIA triad, where the C stands for confidentiality, the I stands for integrity, and the A stands for availability. So typically, like from way back when, whenever people spoke of cybersecurity, these are the three main concepts they um, considered. Of course, as things have evolved and changed, the, it's, it's gone beyond just being a triad. Like at times you may find which some consider possession as something very key, cyber security. Others consider utility, how can you, can you actually use the information that you have um, also being a part of um, cybersecurity. Others consider authenticity, how accurate is this information, is also another concept of um, cybersecurity. But initially, whenever we speak of cybersecurity, and be it in this circle or in any other circles, the traditional definition is what's known as the CIA triad, which covers the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, with respect to what confidentiality is, is anyone um, willing to just attempt to define what that is? Could it, when it comes to security, what is confidentiality? Okay, let me try. All right, thanks, Thomas. Yeah, I think when you, when you talk about confidentiality, it means uh, the information on our internet connected devices they should be available to only those who should be who should access it so i mean like should be accessible to only those who should be able to access it that's what i think mm, yeah that's very true mm, yeah that's very correct um so, so in terms of confidentiality which is basically saying what only the people who are supposed to view something or supposed to access something have access to it or can view it. Um, I don't know, is anyone willing to hazard a guess how, how then do we um, achieve confidentiality as part of security? But what can we do to achieve confidentiality? How can we implement confidentiality? Courage, Kunduj Oh, sorry, this is Spirit. Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, I believe we can also decide uh, uh, through um, granting and revoking some, some 
right, the access to right to certain information. So that uh, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you have to authorize the people with the, with the right to write or admission to access certain information. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, so uh, from what Spiro is saying, we need some sort of access control matrix, some way to say between who gets access to this and um, who gets access to that. Um, maybe, uh, okay, let's say for example, if we are, if you have a file that you record and there's it, Kind of be it in Excel or one of the office suit, how can you achieve confidentiality on that particular file? Like let's say the salaries and you're the financial you're the finance director and you want to um, and you want to achieve confidentiality. Let's scope it down to just a particular word document in a Masala Zivan. How do you achieve confidentiality on that particular document? Any guesses? Hello? Okay, may I try? Uh, Jeremiah, right? Yeah, Jeremiah. I think he, yes, if we ahead. may use, maybe we can use encryption and password protection on the documents. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. As in, you can use password protection. Um, yeah, as Dr. Johns and um, Cliff also highlighted, could see you can use um, encryption. In terms of how you can use encryption, let me just see if I have that application installed here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's see. That's not installed. All right, so um, in terms of how you can implement security or encryption on your system, one tool that you can use is quite simple and straightforward to use, you know, the AES script. I'm not sure if it's still available. Yeah, it seems like it's still available. So um, this particular tool uh, takes your file and it goes on to encrypt it for you. Let me see, where's the download option here? So all you do is you go online, you download it. So what it does is it takes your file and then it encrypts it into a form you could see no one else can actually view it. So now the only way someone can view it is by knowing the password to that particular file. So just as by way of a demonstration, um, Okay, so let's just go ahead and install that. Shouldn't really take much time. So um, for those who haven't used this tool before, this is um, an example of a tool that you can use to implement security or to implement um, confidentiality on your selected files. So, um, for example, today this file has installed notes and it, which is still visible as a TXT file and accessible easily. So now if you right click it, after you install AES script, you'll find the Panica option that runs AES encrypt can be available. So all you do is, like when you right click it, so all you do is you click that, then you create a password that you want to use um, to encrypt that file that you Then you confirm it, then you say okay. So what it then does is it encrypts the file and creates an encrypted copy. So that I saw um, always avoid um, leaving this file that you put. And it's because AES script does not then automatically delete the original file for you. So you're the one who has to go ahead and delete it. So now if I try and open that file, 
all it does is it tells me what I need to enter a password. And if somebody who tries to enter a wrong password, it gives an error with the the message uh, has been altered or the password is incorrect. In this case, the password is incorrect. So the only way someone will be able to view this file is if they know the password. And after the correct password is entered, the file is then created again, Raji, are visible. So basically, whenever you want to implement confidentiality in um, your systems, one example of a tool you can use is AES script, um, which is also free. But then the challenge now that you find with um, my software is Agada ISO, by virtue of them being free, is that people can um, manipulate that file for malicious reasons. Or that application for malicious reasons. Um, there was this one, this one organization I worked with some time back, uh, like a forensic investigation. What happened was somebody had um, installed AES script on one of their servers it would AES script to encrypt all the files and that accessible on their server. Yeah, encrypt on the files, you see, well, they then went on to delete the installation for actually AES script on And after that happened, they then just left a message by desktop PIT. Um, we have encrypted all your files. This is a ransomware attack. Um, pay this amount of uh, money to this particular account or else we will get rid of the key and you won't be able to uninstall or to unencrypt or to decrypt your files. So, yeah, that was like one example of people misusing a security tool for malicious reasons. Could it like these tools that we're using to secure our information can actually be used to attack us in a malicious way, just like um, that particular case. So, Do, sorry, sorry, engineer, how did that one end? Did they pay? Yeah, um, so, uh, no, they got in touch with us and it, so the thing with working with Linux is um, it basically keeps a record of all my different commands and ingara, type of a command line patch. So after going through my logs of a command line, we ended up finding out, oh, these people actually installed this tool in those AES script. And the beauty of this tool in those AES script is, you know, Shansai, this thing called um, symmetric encryption. Has anyone ever come across this terminal, this symmetric encryption? Yes. Any guess could what is symmetric encryption? Yeah, I can this try. Is... Please go ahead, Spirit. Okay, um, symmetric encryption works in, in the manner that the key that is used to encrypt is the same key that is used to decrypt. Unlike in the asymmetric we use different keys. The encryption key is different from the decryption key. So in symmetric, the encryption key is the same as the, decrypt, uh, the decryption key. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's very correct. So um, as Spirit rightly said, when it comes to um, symmetric encryption, we just basically use the exact same key. Think of a key as a password. So the exact same password that we use to encrypt the file is the exact same password we use to decrypt it, like we did in the AES script um, in my demonstration just now. The password that I used to encrypt that file, Iroranzi install notes.txt, was the word password. And so obviously to decrypt it or to unencrypt it, I had to use the exact same word, password also. So. AES scripts is a symmetric encryption um, algorithm. So what we did is, I through my different instructions, is command line. We then found they also put in chi 
the password the actual, which is like really complex and complicated Djibouti. If we had tried to crack it, we would have like spent decades and years trying to crack it. But then luckily we were able to see but we do the password the actual. So what we then basically did then was we um, ran the exact same script, Yangarana, but instead of using the words encrypt, we just changed it to say decrypt. So at the end of the day, just basically ended up um, decrypting all the files on Laripo. And they ended up getting access um, to all the different files that they, uh, um, that they felt this scenario. Because yeah, in a way, we can say it was a ransomware because it was a software that was used to um, try to blackmail them to pay money who made these different hackers. Well, the difference between this attack here, and ransomware ends one cry again, it's back in 2017, 2018, was with one cry, it's used a like asymmetric encryption. What that meant is the password that they used to encrypt was not the password you'd use to decrypt. You had to get like a whole different password, which is like extremely difficult to um, compute or to generate. So they used that technology. Could see even if you knew what the password was that they used to encrypt your files, there was no way you could guess Kuti what's the password to decrypt it unless they gave it to you. So that was the main difference between this attack we experienced and what was broadly known as the WannaCry ransomware. I hope I've answered your question, Leslie. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so basically um, that's what confidentiality is. Um, then the next part of the CIA, CIA triad is um, integrity. So with integrity, when it comes to this aspect of security, we're just trying to make sure that the, the file ritual that we're working with has maintained the same state it had um, initially or primarily. One way I can try and demonstrate this, um, let me see. Um, let me just check if I have a tool which can check my MD5 sums. Mm. All right. So um, on my computer, I have a software already installed in on the MD5 sums. How you can download it is uh, that is for Windows. By default, Colinux it comes pre-installed, so you don't have to install it there. But Windows, you actually have to download it and then install it. So how it works is um, you go, just type in the MD5 Sunset Tools Net, you click that, and then you proceed to download it. I think it's a zip file. You can file one on one social media. So after you're done um, downloading it and installing it, in the same way you normally do with any files, um, what you'd end up having is something like this, whenever you type in could the MD5. No? some a command line, it means you're able to do something with it. 
So let's just clear the screen. So more current folder, Eri, we have this file that runs the install notes.txt. So if we open, Either let's do this. I'm going back to that folder, Eri. We copy the file and we paste it. So what we basically have is two copies of the exact same file that runs the install notes. Hello? Sorry, but a question. Um, Tinashe, is that a question? Um, I guess not. Okay, so um, going back to our folder, we have created a second copy of the exact same file known as the install notes, and it has the exact same contents in Katimar. So instead, yeah, we just leave it at that. All right, let's see. Let's call it two install notes. So it's easier to find. So if you open it, it's still the same content. There's still the same contents. So if we run the command that runs the MD5 sums. On which is start.txt. On all the txt files in this particular folder, and it, you'll find you see two install notes.txt has this particular hash. I'll explain what a hash is, and install notes.txt has the exact same hash. So what the hash is, is like a unique ID that's created for every single file that exists. And it is so, like if you have this file, you know, the install notes.txt, and you run this program or this application, you know, the MD5 sums, it creates a unique ID for that file, you know, the install notes.txt. If you take this file and install master.txt and you put it at any other computer um, outside of mine, it will always still generate a different name, or if you re rename it in any way, it will always give you the exact same hash. However, If we were to come to the same file, Iroro, Hello, is that my end? I think it's lost connectivity. Someone in it, Gully Hipty. I guess the more open the power watch or something. And we can't use the same um, like system in English and any other group. How how do we publicly declare in the Torah's map? How does it work? Can I be like I don't know? I'm just asking. It simply means with the moon and don't go for an article. 
Yeah, declaration yeah. might help. And yeah, or else data saving, but you know, anybody. Uh, I think the difference will come in documentation. The documentation definitely will differ. Yeah, I think you are talking. Yeah, um, sorry, I don't think you booted out so much. Okay, um, so what I'll do is I'll just wrap up and then um, we'll pick up where we left off tomorrow. Okay, because I see Dr. Ta first um, seven. Hello, can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. yes. That's so, okay. um, so I guess I'm not sure with the alpha had you seen in the demonstration in MG5 sums. But what, what I'll do is um, I'll just start with this demonstration tomorrow. But no Tanga at five thirty. Um, yeah, then we can pick up pick up from where we had left off in the presentation. Yeah, sure. So again, as I mentioned initially, the approach that we are taking this semester, which is different, it's no longer an issue. You could see we come to you and we just give you my slides and we read the slides to you and you download the slides and you give back to us everything you've seen in the slides. Now, it's more of we just outline my concepts completely. And then you do a bit more research yourselves and um, present here and there on new topics. Because obviously, even though I am a field, a security actor, but I know and I understand like most of you or many of you have a lot more experience, be it um, practically experiencing Messiah by attacks or dealing with Messiah by attacks. So this is more like a platform. I would see not only do you sort of like learn from me in a way, but I also learn from your experiences and um, everything else. So yeah, um, don't be too worried. Mukawanat is not Pizama slides because that's not the objective of um, the course anymore. It's more focused on research. But even when my examinations are actual, you'll find that the questions are more research focused um, and application focused as compared to just basically outlining what's the, what is the definition of this and what's the definition of that. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, any comments, questions before we wrap up? Uh, um, say. Okay. okay, you can go ahead, baby. Oh. Okay, um, say I wanted to ask you something. Uh, it is in the public domain that um, once upon a time, maybe three years ago, HIIT was attacked with WannaCry. For security reasons, you may not comment on whether it happened or not. But what I'm mainly interested in, how did they manage to come out of that because they were being asked to pay some huge sums of money? Did they pay? If no, how did they then work around that? <laughs> uh, yeah, th thanks for that question, Spirit. That leads to, I guess, one of the topics we'll be covering in this course for Section A pen testing, which is um, NDA, Kanama, non disclosure agreements. As tempting as it is for me to justify and explain what actually happened, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not allowed to do so. But yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I really can't. But um, hypothetically speaking, um, yeah, companies, some do tend to pay, and but then the thing is you have to understand what you're dealing with criminals, so you can't really trust them on their word, but they'll pay whatever it is that um, you, or they'll, they'll give you whatever you'd have paid for. Um, so yeah, it's a very complicated topic. Like even now, if you look at my cases, that America, I think there's like Colonial when it was hacked, um, like the pipeline organization, and then there was also this JS, I think it's JS Meats or something like this big company, Rimu Meats Industry. They all attacked them at somewhere. But then 
obviously the FBI are saying which don't pay um, because you're just enabling them. On the other side, there's their clients saying we need our information or we need to be assured that everything is in control. So obviously they were tempted to pay. So yeah, it's it's a complicated thing. Um, but unfortunately, again, I can't really respond to that question. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, no, that's fine. But my main issue or way I was taking my question to is uh, on the mode yeah. of payment, they had insisted that they wanted to, to be paid through the Bitcoin. And back then, mm. the Bitcoin was in was something far aloof in as far as the Zimbabwean environment. Okay. So suppose I meet such a similar situation where I'm asked to go through that route. How best can you advise me, maybe as the security person, or maybe if I engage you as my consultant? Yeah. Um, the, the company line would be, we do not negotiate with terrorists, basically. So. Um, the first statement will be, no, you should not pay um, my, what's it, those ransomware people. But then again, I think you will cover it, kind of shake up a section here, my elements of a malicious operation. I would see once you're compromised, there's something like a ransomware. Um, that person who's compromised Hello? Um, can you still hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes, sure. Yes. Yeah, I think my network is acting up. So just quickly um, in response. So as I was saying, like with most of these marine software companies, they'll try and make sure could see they have good company relations with their victims. So in such a case, if you had to pay the ransomware, Gone. I'm sure it's gone. Mm. But maybe like the class reps can ask gone up yeah. Even Tinashe is left. Tinashe is going to have a good recording. He was booted out by the net, really. I wouldn't have a good room. I don't record and it's not my room. Eh, but he left a long pace, guys. I think it's the network. Yeah, 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 it's the first seven. 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 And to me, bye bye. 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 Bye